Hello, and welcome back to episode seven of your favorite variety guests D and D um, talk back thing. I don't know if you can tell by the sound of my voice, but I'm very excited tonight because we have yet another amazing guest lined up for your viewing and or listening pleasure. Yes, that's right. We have the very, very talented Liquor Witch joining us tonight. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you, Crit. How are we doing this evening? Um, yeah, I'm pretty good. Pretty good. Um, pretty good not going to lie. Awesome. I've, had a, uh, I've had a very full on couple of weeks. Um, Gemma and I are both going through um, our own uh, separation um, proceedings with our with our ex partners, and it's been it's been quite taxing on the on the both of us, which is why we haven't been able to put out uh, an episode uh, for the last couple of weeks. But that's okay because those um, those things are going to be coming to a close very soon, and I'll be able to have a little bit more energy and mm -hmm. run a couple more streams. So looking mm -hmm. forward to that. Sorry to hear that, champ. That must be really taxing. But I'm really glad you decided to have me on tonight. I'm really excited. Yeah. So. Um, for those people who are watching and or listening to the podcast variant of this, wherever it is that you consume this particular content, um, we were meant to be recording uh, the second episode of The Weird The Witching Hour tonight, on which you are one of the cast members. Unfortunately, uh, because of some, uh, I want to say scheduling errors. Uh, it's the big bad of any D and D campaign. It's always scheduling issues. It is. It it, it yeah. is. It's like a. It's like that ghost hanging over every campaign Everything. out there. Anyone who's ever played a, a D and D campaign or tabletop role playing games in general knows that the real uh, big bad evil guy is scheduling conflicts. Oh, dude, tell me about it. Like right now, Avalon is looking at an extended hiatus and it's breaking my heart into a million pieces, but we can talk about that in a bit. But yeah, it's all it's all scheduling stuff and real life stuff, which is unfortunate. But at the end of the day, I can't get too upset that my friends are going out there and building beautiful lives and growing as people. I can't help but be proud of them. But at the same time, I'm desperately sad that they're not <laughs> sitting around telling stories and hallucinating vividly with me while we play Dungeons and Dragons. So well, I, that is what it is. I am upset about that. Is it too much to ask um, that my friends yeah, is it, just... Is it too much to ask that they just come and hang out with me every Saturday at the same time? I just want... Really, is it that much, too much to ask? I want all of my friends to be completely socially and culturally stagnant um, yeah. as long as beholden, we're playing DD. Beholden to my will at all times, mm. even if I'm not the dungeon master. <laughs> mm. Exactly. That's why I do this. Um, it's not yeah. about creating stories or having fun. No. It's, just, it's really just about it's, boosting it's my ego. It's about control and it's about power and it's about making yourself in the image of a god. That's exactly <laughs> That's why, why do I it, do right? what I do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Unfortunately, I fall short in the real world, so I have to sort of make these things up in my head. And um, every now and then, yeah. I, I convince someone to join me. But uh, yeah. <laughs> All I'm going to say is, Finn, fake it till you make it. If you convince yourself you're a god in certain spheres, it's only so long before those spheres of influence start to touch each other. And then, you know, who knows? Who well, knows? Um, I do I do enjoy the sound of spheres of influence touching each other, um, but that's that's a whole different podcast. I'll do a podcast about yeah, that. We, and, uh, uh, so that, that podcast is going to be called uh, Mind Goblin. Mind Goblin. I like that. Did you just yeah. come up with that? Did you improvise that? Mind Goblin, these nuts. <laughs> I do apologize, but no, I'm not sorry. No, that's <laughs> that's exactly why we do critical conversations. Sometimes you just want to sit down and just talk some shit with your friends. Um, and that's exactly what 100%. we do here. It makes for far more engaging uh, content. And trust me, do not hold back on the inappropriate jokes because... Um, you, I feel I feel by the end of this you may come to regret that, but we'll see. Usually it's me getting in trouble, and like this is a recorded session. This isn't airing until probably the weekend, so I'll just go ahead and I'll I can I can edit out anything that either of us might say that's and like radically uh, inappropriate, and we'll just upload that as Patreon content. We've got to put that behind. Okay, the paywall. fantastic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we have to we have to put the really bad uh, these nuts jokes behind the paywall. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we're if we're gonna offend people, we should at least be getting paid for it. That's. Or, or if people are paying for the content, then they already know what they're getting into. They, they know so, what they're getting you know, into. It's 
that's as close to informed consent as you're ever going to get with content making of this of this caliber i would argue pretty much yeah so if you found your way uh to our patreon and you're and you're listening to this um and it's only available on the patreon you know that it's it's going to go downhill from here so buckle yourselves in because i think tonight's going to be a a wild this can ride. only end well it can only I'm end just well saying, it can only end well for us <laughs> yeah, for us. Uh, maybe not so much your eardrums, but well, that that does still remain to be seen or heard, as the case may be. Well, uh, if anyone's offended, uh, please feel free to call in, let us know your thoughts, uh, and uh, I'll be sure to uh, to completely ignore those. And keep <laughs> also, doing please please know if you do call in uh, with uh, anger and complaints, um, we we may or may not roast the ever loving shit out of you. Mm. Because we all know that the best coffee is shit out by uh, by some sort of cat-like creature in the forest, and so therefore the best memes are born of bullshit. So I wish that wasn't true, um, but it is true, isn't it? There's it a, is there's, true. A, there's a coffee out it there is that is pooped out by some type of cat, um, and and it's really good. Is it? Have I you had it? What, yeah, I have. It's actually really good. <laughs> I don't know which what makes that's... Me, which, makes, which makes me deeply upset because I know the whole thing is incredibly inhumane and unsustainable and I, I drank it um, when it was on offer at a conference that I was at for work. Um, and it, it, it felt wrong to consume and I haven't taken it since, but I felt very much the same way as I would if I was offered hu- like human meat. Mm-hmm. Like if mm-hmm. I was offered the opportunity to eat human meat, I probably would. You'd probably you'd give it a try, right? Yeah. You'd have to. Yeah, um, I, I think I'd have to for like, for like I'd have a moral obligation to uh, eat what was provided. Yeah, as long as I had proof that it was Look. like, you know, like someone donated their body for science and someone donated their body for fun. If it's already there, it would be unethical yeah. to eat it. I, I, I find because yeah, like, otherwise it'd like, just like, be a waste. I'm a- I'm a big proponent of sustainability, so you know it's, it, it would be a real shame to waste it. And we all know that humans are the most sustainable things on the planet, after all. Mm. Uh, it does say something a little bit about our culture that the best coffee that you can get is something shit out by a cat. Um, but let's not dive too deeply into that because we have we have something that we need to cover because every episode of Critical Conversation starts with an icebreaker question. Now, the last episode that I did with Grace. I went through the player's handbook and I gave her a few uh, mundane items and asked her whether or not she could guess what the value of those items were. But I don't like to do the same thing twice. Lightning doesn't strike in the same place twice. That's not true. It, it does. It does a lot of times. It but definitely anyway, does. It does. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> that's does. Like, like... Uh, that's, it, it, I said it for the, the sake of drama and so nothing if not dramatic. Um, so we're going to do something a little bit uh, a little bit different this time. I've got, okay. I've got my copy of the uh, certified Wizards of the Coast 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons player's handbook right here. And I flip to the back. Uh, where these spells are. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a couple of spells right out of the player's handbook. And what I want you to do is is see whether or not you can tell me the spell's level and the spell's uh, domain. So be it abjuration, transmutation, oh, so on and so magic. forth. School okay. of magic. Okay. Yes, school okay. of magic. That's the word. That's the word. Um, okay. So school uh, of magic and spell level. Okay. Okay. I'm not. I'm not confident in my abilities for this, but neither am I. Um, just, just so you guys can see my hands, I'm not going to be googling the answers. This is going to be running entirely off the meat sack filled with electricity that is my brain. Okay. So, All uh, right. scouts on it. Do like myself a good meat sack from time to time, but uh, I digress. Shall we launch straight into this one? Because I think I think it's going to be interesting. I wouldn't even know the answer to these questions if I didn't have the book in front of me. So, all okay. right, um, let's start with something fairly well known. What do we got? All right, um, let's go with uh, animal friendship. Ooh, uh, that is a level one spell. And I'm pretty sure it's not abjuration because that's spells and shields. It's not evocation because that's destruction. It's. Is it illusion? 
Is that your final answer, Illusion? I'm just like I'm trying to rack my brain to think of which one it is because it's it's not divination, it's not evocation, it's not necromancy, um, it's not transmutation. No, no. you're correct there. I'll I'll tell you that much, and I will also tell you we're correct on the uh, on the spell level. It is a first level spell. Bonus what are the what, can can you can you give me a clue? What are the remaining schools that I haven't covered already? Um. Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, we've covered transmutation, uh, necromancy, enchantment, evocation, um, evocation, abjuration. I believe I already said abjuration. Um, did we cover all illusion um, and divination? I think that's all of them. Yes, I believe that's all. Of them. <laughs> All right, if I had to pick one out of all of them, I would probably say Abjuration. You're going to go with Abjuration. Okay. Yeah. So you got um, you got half of that one correct. It was a first level spell. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it is Animal Friendship is, in fact, an enchantment spell. It is, oh. it is the act of enchanting uh, an animal. Damn. Which we okay. as DMs do all the time. It's it's our it's the staple of our our craft. It is. It um, is. Damn. Okay. You know what? I'll take the half point. That's that's, that's half I, point. I know at least. I know at least. I knew what it wasn't. I just didn't know what it was. You didn't know what it was. I tried when you asked me what what schools uh, we hadn't covered yet. I tried to sneakily just throw it in there nonchalantly in the hope that you wouldn't pick up on it because I'm pretty sure it was the only one that you didn't actually mention. Um, yeah, no, I thought that, and then I thought, hang on, I'm pretty sure it's not an enchantment, but then again, of course, this is an enchantment because it's not abjuration and it's not transmutation and it's not uh, illusion either. And I knew it was going to be one of those. Mm, so ones, you're but like, I couldn't remember which one exactly it was. Affecting the minds of the animals. So yeah, an yeah. enchantment for that yeah. one. Um, all right, don't worry, I wouldn't have remembered enchantment school either. Um, again, again, most of you guys saw my hands were busy the entire time, so I did not look that shit up because I believe in. Sportsmanship. Sportsmanship. I don't. And so much as this is sportsmanship. I don't. I definitely don't. Uh, if there's a way that okay. I can cheat, I'm definitely going to do that. All right. Um, okay. Next one. Yeah, Let's go I'll with something. Yeah, fudging dice rolls. Oh. Like, oh, <laughs> That's why I as play a, D and D a, online. As, a, as another, as a fellow dungeon master, I too fudge dice rolls. <laughs> but you'll never, you'll never let me, uh, you'll never see me telling my players which ones I do fudge and which ones I don't. No. Well, it's it's all about developing that poker face, you know. Yeah, well, I don't really have one of those. If any of you guys have watched any of my streams, unfortunately, I am very expressive in the facial <laughs> region, uh, which um, I have used to my advantage sometimes because some of the fuckery my players get up to, I can't help but react to. Uh, but yeah, anyway, let, right. let, let's go back to the challenge. Okay, hands let's are go up. To, let's go to the next one. Okay, something a little bit more left field. Um, oops, excuse me. Um, Anti-life shell. Have you even cast this spell before? Have you seen it cast? I know it's I know it's abjuration. Oh wait, no, it's either abjuration or necromancy. It's one of the two. Oh, starting to doubt. Well, because no, abjuration is the school of like, 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 uh, like placing wards, shields, um, and that sort of thing, which is what I would expect the shell spell to be. But then you said anti life, which is making me think it's necromancy. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm pretty sure that is a level three spell. So level three abjuration. Yeah, I'm gonna go with level three abjuration. Okay, um, abjuration no. is correct. It is an abjuration okay. spell. Okay. But it, awesome. It is a level five spell. In my defense, I've never heard of it before in my life. So I've never, never heard of it either. That's why. I, that's why I wanted to throw it out there. Um, Anti-life shell. What does it even do? A shimmering barrier extends out from you in a ten-foot radius and moves with you, remaining centered on you and hedging out creatures other than undead and constructs. The barrier lasts for the duration. The barrier prevents an affected creature from passing or reaching through. An affected creature can cast spells or make attacks with range or reach weapons through the barrier. If you move so that an affected creature is forced to pass through the barrier, the spell ends. Okay, well, there you go. Very situational spell, but uh, look, we're all learning something here. All right. Mm. Um, let's go with one that you 
probably have heard of, but might not get cast that often. Let's go with... Um, hmm. Hmm. Blink. Oh. Would you like the uh, the spell description? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Um, when casting Blink, you roll a d20 at the end of each of your turns for the duration of the spell. On a roll of 11 or higher, you vanish from your current plane of existence and appear in the ethereal plane. At the start of your next turn when the spell ends, if you are on the ethereal plane, you return to an unoccupied space of your choice that you can see within 10 feet of the space you vanished from. If no unoccupied space is available, blah, 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 blah. So basically, at the end of each turn, you have a 50-50 chance to vanish into the ethereal plane and then come back on the next turn. This is a, this is a, this is a pretty difficult one. I don't think... I'd be able to get the... I don't think I'd be able to get this one if I didn't have the book in front of me. But I wouldn't admit that in court. I'm pretty sure Blink is a level 5 spell. And I'm pretty sure it's Transmutation. School of Transmutation. You're good on the... Um... On the what was it? Uh, schools of magic. You've got this one. Okay, correct. so it is transmutation. It is transmutation. It's either because it's not it's not level nine because the risks are too high for a level nine. Um. Okay. Mm, okay, I'm gonna adjust that, and I'm gonna go third level. Third transmutation. Level. Third level yeah. transmutation. Ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. It is a third level transmutation spell. That's why you are a <laughs> phenomenal it's DM. It's business, baby. <laughs> um, Everything's fucky wucky there. <laughs> ever seen that spell cast before by any of your players? Uh, no. no. No, I haven't. I think I think, I think, think the, the risk of being blipped out into the ethereal plane is too much for them quite often because the games that I run tend to be set in the Feywild because... The loosey goosey nature of the rules of physics uh, do appeal to me there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. quite a lot, which means it's a lot easier for me to bend the rules of 5e around when we're there. Yep. Um, but that's not to say it won't happen, it just hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. You know, it might be a, a fun spell to, uh, to put on some of the creatures, um, I think, uh, just having them occasionally just bamp out of existence not actually describe to the players what's happening and then just having them reappear the next round within 10 feet of where I mean, they disappeared Could i mean fun. i've done something i've done something similar with hags but that's not blink that's something else entirely so um hags have the ability to turn ethereal don't they yeah yeah they do but that's yes. it's not a blink because i can still yes. they can move with intention yes. within that space so. that's right yeah um here's a little uh little little facts, little tidbit about myself. Um, hags uh, were the first time I experienced a TPK. Um, really? Yes. Interesting. Yeah, we were playing um, Curse of Stride. It was my first ever campaign. Uh, we happened to come across the windmill. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the uh, with the adventure. Uh, yeah, no, I've, no. Never, I've, never, I've never played Curse of Stride. Okay, well, so. spoiler alert for those people uh, listening or watching this at home. Um, there is a windmill uh, where there are some hags, um, and they they use some questionable methods uh, to create their meat pies uh, for the town. Uh, oh, I'm lovely! That's a little a little uh, Sweeney Todd. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. Um, so I, I just I just didn't feel like my character could walk away from that one. I was very new to, to D and D, so I ended up getting the party into a uh, into a bit of a situation that we couldn't come back mm. from. But that's okay because we got our revenge in the end. I must have been an absolute terror to be a DM for. But um, keep your eyes here on the on the Twitch channel or um, on the podcast or whatever because I'm sure I'm going to have Luke uh, from Big Game Small Pieces as a guest on pretty soon as well. He was the dungeon master for that campaign. Mm. Um, speaking of which, 
what was um what was your first uh D D slash tabletop rpg experience where did this journey begin so oh, the you? journey began uh very very uh, a while ago in a very stunted growth sort of way it mm -hmm. was one of my flatmates back in like 2017 2018 he'd been playing D, &D for a long time and he would talk about it and he sounded like he was having such fun and i've grown up with the likes of like dungeon siege and all of these other really intense solo player like rpg games and i was like this sounds fucking rad as hell mm -hmm. um i've been a creative type since i was i could i could walk essentially and you know telling stories has always been something really big in my family too so then when we started talking about playing dnd &D, i was like okay i want to give it a go and it ended up being one session played on the floor in our lounge in our shoe little flat we were all hammered but i was playing a a, a tiefling bard uh called ori and uh my partner at the time was playing like a like a little little wizened hermit monk kind of guy who was hammered all the time so i had to drag him around on the shelf behind me which is a really apt metaphor for how that part of my life was going and <laughs> thankfully i did cut the rope off eventually yeah uh, he was a piece of shit let's, let's 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 move away from that um but so that was the first one and that was the first session i played and it sort of put the bug in me a little bit because i at that point um i was in a really dark place you know because of a whole bunch of stuff that relationship included everything was going really poorly and i hadn't been like i, I hadn't got in touch with my creative self for a really long time so i'd like i'd stopped drawing i'd stopped um, making music i'd stopped writing stories i'd stopped investing in that part of myself until i played that and then all of a sudden the bug bit me again i got back into drawing character art i got back into thinking about character stories mm -hmm. um and then it sort of laid nascent in me for a really really long time until i started playing my first ever proper campaign um with a friend of mine called jackson fantastic dungeon master fantastic person just generally all round fucking excellent guy um he asked me if i wanted to be part of his campaign and i said yes uh because this was you know like right after lockdown started i wasn't going to work because everything had locked locked down yep. in, in new zealand for ages um and then we basically started playing like i think once every three or four days because like we were all on lockdown and everything was going fine and we were playing D, &D on hard mode so this was like long rests would take a week Ooh. a short rest was 24 hours like minimal healing potions that sort of thing because okay. he'd come he'd come from playing warhammer so it was yes. very like a grim dark kind of stuff yep but he'd also be he'd also been playing DD at that point for like 10 10 years okay and he was excited to do something different and that was when i played my first proper character dimu who was a celestial drow warlock um who basically form informed my entire dungeons and dragons experience because she was the first character that i really really connected with and yep. just so much happened to her and i was going through so much at the same time and it was just yeah uh play that that campaign never came to an end unfortunately that was one of the ones that was uh beaten to death by the big bad of scheduling conflicts and then mm. other life stuff going on and yep. all that sort of stuff yep. um and but she does still live inside me and she sort of informed how i uh interact with the world of creativity that goes on inside my head when it when i think about this stuff because honestly i'm not going to put too fine a point on it dungeons and dragons did save my life yep. i did not have this way of expressing myself and if i did not have this way of playing in a sandbox of experience mm -hmm. and this collaborative storytelling i would not be here today i straight up wouldn't <laughs> well um uh, yeah so, no if we needed yeah, that, was, if... that was my first that was my first experience i like demo demo and and ori and my very first early characters uh are so ingrained in me to the point where like they became independent characters like separate from myself with their own motivations and their own ways of speaking and their own entire personalities yes separate yes and that's a crazy thing about playing D D, <laughs> and uh yeah. you, you probably had a, a similar experience when you're dming as well as when when you're dming if if you're really into it if you're into the story if you're into what's happening at that particular moment you don't refer to your players names they barely even exist anymore as people of course they're, they're they're there your friends you're having fun or whatever but when those really intense and emotional or um you know just those tense moments you refer to the characters 
Oh my dude, it even gets it even gets to the point where like I'm having a conversation between two NPCs and I'll say something and then wait for the other NPC to respond before remembering that I am actually both of them. And I have to have this conversation because <laughs> in my mind they're so separate and so like divested from myself within that that it's hard to pull that back together sometimes and it's just Ooh. You know, like that's Oh, sorry. I'm just losing. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. yeah sorry. I just, I just moved my microphone a little bit and um, okay. unplugged itself. But as I was saying, that's the beauty of it. Like that's the whole thing, right? Like they, they are so simultaneously you and not you. Yes. Yes. It's all about. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of escapism, but it's, it's, it goes so much further than escapism. It's like exploring yeah. parts of you that you otherwise wouldn't have a sort of safe environment to be able yeah. to explore. And I find the more episodes of critical conversations that I do and the more conversations that I have with people in uh, D&D and tabletop role playing game sort of um, sphere, I guess, the more I hear variations of the same uh motivations and those those same stories um mm -hmm. i went through a similar thing as well you know i went through um high school um i'm on the spectrum and i same, same what yes ah <laughs> uh, do i even i don't even know where to begin to describe I don't know, what uh, i don't know what hd is but the doctor said i got 80 of them yeah your, your, your high definition <laughs> You're uh, your 8K. I'm in, I'm in 4K, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm 720p at best. Um, at the best. That's okay. Times. That's that's a good enough resolution for me. If I if I take my glasses off, I can't tell. That's either that's way. good enough. And um, with upscaling these days, it's uh, it's totally yeah, fine. Yeah, it's fine. Um, like, don't even worry about it. Your, your actual human eyeballs can't see much more than 80 frames per second anyway. It's exactly. just anything else is a trick. Anything else that they use just, as a marketing gimmick. Yeah, <laughs> so. and look, I'm a sucker for a good marketing gimmick. I like <laughs> yeah. to have my frame rate. Yeah, it's insane. Um, I'm not gonna lie to you. 240p looks way better. It does. I it think. does. Even if it's just my brain, brain telling yeah. <laughs> telling me that that's the case, I'm okay with that. It's the ultimate. It's the ultimate placebo effect. It's the same part of my brain that's telling me this mix between triple triple second tequila is a is a good taste. Um, so, I I appreciate that part of my brain. Mm. Mm. But yeah, no, a lot of people have the same experience. And like I went through high school and uh, into adulthood, you, you sort of have that side sort of crushed a little bit, sort of pushed back mm. into the background because you think you're doing the right thing by sort of, I don't know, masking a little bit. Uh, it's pushing, always masking. Yeah, it's masking, always masking. Push, pushing that personality yep. down so that you can be a part of a society that you don't actually really fit in with. Well, it's because it's not, it's not made for us, bud. No, it's no. not. It's not. It's not made for us. Uh, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, there's a there's an important thought that I want to share here a little bit. Um, I definitely understand the upcoming of like, like like when you were a kid, did you have like all these big stories inside of you, and you were super excited to share them, even if they weren't like, yes, what everyone else was doing. Yes. And then you got to that point of your human development when you started to realize that like, oh, okay, maybe this isn't. This isn't how everyone else thinks so then now i have to try to fit into this really sort of it's not necessarily narrow but it's a very specifically shaped mm -hmm. kind of niche that yes. a lot of other people want you to fit into and then like you try to shove yourself into all these weird little puzzle pieces and try to hold yourself in and in doing that it's like it quenches that that fire that's in you until the point where it's like it's like one little coal in there and the rest of it's ash but there's one little coal and then it won't quite go out yes as you long know? as that's yeah. there um <laughs> yeah. you're, you're right it is it's, it's very limited if these days if you're not into especially in the fields that i'm working if you're not into fishing if you're not into watching a good old game of kickball on the weekend with your mates um then you very much find yourself on the outline people don't do it on purpose um don't get me wrong people aren't like um like not including you in things because it's something that they get some kind of well, like sick they're, pleasure they're not, gate, they're not gatekeeping you from it. Either. No, no, absolutely not. Um, yeah. But it's hard to find that those things that you you know that you can relate to other people uh, with when your um, you know when your experiences and your your uh, 
what you enjoy is so much wildly different and it's hard to relate to people and they, they sort of pick up on that but that's the great thing about uh dnd and tabletop rpgs it's ever since i started playing this and i don't know if you've probably had the same experiences not a single person has ever questioned my sanity I, I, I like ever ever since I started playing D and D. There's yeah. there's been nothing that I've done so far where people have looked at me and and, and sort of treated me like I'm strange. Because that, that's something that I got a lot um, was to sort mm -hmm. of look um, like as as if you're a stray dog or something like that. Um, you know, they it's not that they dislike you, but you just don't you're not really in the place where you belong. I don't have yeah, that. Yeah, or it's or it's or it's or it's kind of or it's kind of just like that like you know, square peg, round hole kind of situation. Yes. Where, like, they can tell that you're a peg of some sort, but they don't quite know where you fit, and therefore they can't quantify you, so they don't know how to treat you or interact with you until you mask yourself to sort of match what they th what you think they think you are. Yes, exactly. And it's yeah, exhausting. Yeah, and that's exhausting. It's so tiring. It's so tiring. Like, oh, oh man, it's it, it's it's the worst. And like, I applaud anyone who is neurodivergent and constantly operating in neurotypical spaces because that it, it is so hard. It is so hard. And if you're out there, we see you. We welcome you with open arms. We do. We but do. Just yeah, like we know it's hard. Yes. I've been there. Spin's been there. We understand. But on the, the plus struggle. side, we also know what it's like to be on the other side of that, or at least like speaking from personal experience, I do anyway. And I'm just, I know I'm incredibly, incredibly privileged to be able to say so. But like, it does get better out there. It 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 does. It, <laughs> it does. It's hard. It's it's hard, especially when you're in places that aren't built for you, and you have to ad learn how to advocate for yourself and the other neurodiverse folks around you but it does get better yeah no it definitely does um there was a time and like my experience my story is is fairly similar uh to yours i found myself almost completely socially isolated um i was going to work i was going home and i wasn't really uh interacting with anyone there was a time before that when i was working um as a bouncer i got a bit of social interaction and you know the people the, the the nightlife people are already yeah. a bit strange so i fit oh, in dude, a... no dude dude i'm 100 with you there i yeah. worked i attended bar for 10 years yes. that was where i got that level of social interaction from but yeah i was working two jobs and trying to study while supporting someone who wanted the opposite of that mm -hmm. so yeah and it, it, it does become that like you're masking at work all the time yes and you're grasping at the small straws of the social interaction but but by the end of the night you're so worn out from both the forced interaction and your job that to go home and try to be a functional person after that is so overwhelming and then it's just it's very very like, difficult and it affects the people oh, around you as well yeah unfortunately um so yeah for especially anyone... especially if they don't understand how, what it's like and they just keep pressuring you to try and do better and you're already doing your best and you don't know how to do more of your best yes. and then you just end up exhausted from the shell of yourself yes exactly um mm -hmm. so this is a it, it's been the most welcoming and amazing community that i've ever been a part of and i'm so mm -hmm. very grateful for that and if there's anyone out there who is listening or is watching this at the moment and you're not quite sure where you fit and i can almost guarantee you you will find like-minded people in this community you know, so jump in our Discord, Twitch, whatever. And if you want to join uh, Liquor Witches community and you have your own pretty cool community going on as well, um, you can find Liquor Witch uh, on Twitch. That is at www.twitch.tv slash Liquor Witch. Uh, where else can they find you if they want to? Um, you know, uh, it, my with? Instagram handle is the same. Um, Discord is a flail and flagon, which you can reach by my Twitch chat um but pretty much everybody has a seat at my table yes um you know and i think that's that's one of the big things that has drawn me so much to the ttrpg community is that like the good folks that are here want everyone to have a seat at the table and they will make space for you yes exactly always um which is unless unless you're unless you're a real piece of shit just coming in just like start shit and then by all you will get bounced very quickly and very effectively um yeah see I, I came in to start shit no one's no one's banned yeah, me yet <laughs> no one's banned me yet <laughs> i just tried to position myself in a seat of authority and uh people are too too afraid to get i mean yeah like quite like like quite often people who like act in such a way as into like 
deliberately sow discord and all that sort of stuff. Yes. Uh, quite often, they're reaching out for some sort of social communication and just haven't found a way that works for them yet. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in saying that, like, if you come in and you come in hot, like, you're gonna get learnt a learning real yeah. quick. Yes. But yeah. if you are open minded and take that learning aboard, you'll be all right, kid. It is a very if you welcoming down and make community. It worse. Yeah, it is if a very welcoming community. A very open, very accepting. But if you're if you're coming in to make other people's lives difficult, um, mm -hmm. they will call you out um, quicker than quicker than you can imagine. Quicker than you can roll a natural one on your yeah, charisma quicker, check. Yeah, quicker. Quicker. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, like uh, please please jump on our discords. Uh, I have an open door policy. If there's anything that you need to talk about, if you're looking for a game to join or anything like that i'd be more than happy to help you out and i'm sure the same is true for you as well it is it is um, um unfortunately due to a lot of, lots of constraints with my time with work and all the other projects i have on the back burner at the moment like my time is limited but my uh, attention and care is not yes exactly um i say i have an open door policy uh but i don't have an open time policy unfortunately so yeah i'll probably That's the thing. like if i had the time i would be here but but like my 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 like my baseline is, if you're wanting a seat at my table, I will make space for you. Yes. Until you decide that you don't want it or need it anymore, and then by all means, let let yourself out. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. But mm. at the same time, like if you are here at the table, you know you make room for others too. Because exactly. how else is everyone supposed to sit and exactly. eat at the same time? Yes. You know, <laughs> like. Um. You mentioned. Uh, you mentioned. That you've got a lot going on at the moment. That's a very, very busy time in your life. You mm -hmm. were, you were before we went live with this episode. You were, you were telling me a couple of, couple of exciting projects that you've been working on. Do you want to share mm -hmm. those um, live as well? Or yeah, I mean, I'd love to if, if that's okay. Please um, do. I think, I think the, the long and short of it is, is, is that I recognise that I am in an, an incredibly privileged position to be able to say that I have found my dream job. I work at a library. I'm an assistant librarian. This is a job that I've wanted to have since I was five years old. My mum still has the photos of me when I was a little kid with my library assistant badge. Aww. Like, well in there. Um, and I work at a tertiary tertiary university library, um, which means there's... I don't get to interact with the public so much, but the folks who come to me usually come to me because they need help with something, and that is what I am best at. I am a helper through and through, and... I am so lucky that I get to work with a cohort of fantastic, like-minded, and just really open and welcoming folks. Uh, the environment of working in libraries is really, really neurodivergent friendly. Even if some of the older, uh, even if some of the uh, the folks that you work with don't quite understand, uh, they still make space and they still accommodate without me having to push for it or like advocate for myself in a really, really hardcore way, which is really, really refreshing. Mm. Um, in saying that, uh, it is so awesome that I get to do what I do. And part of what I do is I run classes weekly at the library that I work at for doing tabletop minis and tabletop painting. And basically what we do is every Thursday we sit down for about an hour and talk shit about Dungeons and Dragons, about Warhammer, about other table stuff, other tabletop stuff that we're doing. And we paint minis. We do 3D printing there at the uh, Tidua Makerspace at UC Canterbury. Um, it's just a really wholesome and legitimately enjoyable part of like, like I would do it for free even if I wasn't getting paid for it like if they asked me to come in and do it like as volunteer to, I probably would but um, I get to work in the space where I get to do that and not only that but like my bosses and stuff play Dungeons and Dragons like to the point where my immediate manager harassed me basically into listening to the Dungeons, Dungeons and Daddies podcast which I hadn't listened to before okay. and he would hassle me at least once a week being like have you listened to it yet have you listened to the new episode yet have you listened to it yet and I'm like no <laughs> but I did and it was fantastic and like just it is this is this is what I meant earlier by when I said that things do get better out there and you do find your tribe eventually um I didn't even need a university qualification when I started working here it was just dumb luck and having the kind of personality that fit because i'm the personality hire i am one of the big extroverts at my work and everybody else is an introvert so mm -hmm. i take the social load for like 90 percent of the stuff that happens for interdepartmental stuff but it's fine because i get to do what i do and it's fucking fantastic if you have any questions about it Sven, please ask because i would love to answer them 
Um, no, I, 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 I do. I have a lot of questions. Um, first of all, like, did you, with the, with the miniature painting and that kind of stuff that you do at work, was that mm -hmm. your idea? Is that something that you came up yes. with? Or is that a pre-established yes. sort of thing? No, no, it was something that I came up with because I was spending a lot of my time, because um, at my work there's quite a lot of downtime where usually we'd go and do like, like shelf checking, and various other bits and bobs of stuff that need done throughout the library. But um, again, as I said, I have ADHD. So if you give me a task to do, I will do it in about 20 minutes and then have about 40 minutes left of the hour that you assign me for that task to just sort of fart around and kind of do nothing. So I would be shelf checking and doing everything that I needed to do. Do it very, very quickly because once you tell me what the uh, boundaries of the, of the tasks that you've set me are, I can meet those like that, like no problem. But then I would find myself in the makerspace constantly like setting up 3D mini printing stuff, uh, doing paintings, talking to other folks about what they were doing in the makerspace. Because the whole point of the Tidua makerspace in the library that I work at is like you're not, you're not really allowed. I say allowed, but it's sort of like like you, you don't bring your academic stuff in there. Mm -hmm. It's a space where you make things. Yes. Like like we cover the tables in brown paper so people can draw all over them. We have racks upon racks of painting equipment, jewelry making supplies. Um, basically anything you could think of that doesn't require big stuff like lathes or woodworking equipment or pottery yep. equipment anything like that like we don't have any of that stuff because that's kind of a health and safety nightmare so we don't really go too much into that but anything you can make with your hands pretty much you have accessible there and it's free for staff and students and it's kind of just one of those places where i felt immediately myself i did not have to mask in there at all and also the the two head librarians of that space are also neurodivergent as well so when i was talking to them it was kind of like oh yeah we understand each other on a level that may be difficult for other people to understand but like we get it mm -hmm. and we get it and i don't have to explain to you why i think this would be a good idea okay it's just a matter of setting it up with my bosses yes so when i when i when i brought the subject up to jess who is the uh like the manager and like the whole the whole person behind the two door maker space she's fantastic she's won awards for sustainability across uc she's just a fantastic truly truly incredible person big ups to jess big loves um but when i mentioned it to her like hey i know you need more folk around in the makerspace especially during lunch times and i quite often have those times free because i start really early in the morning um do you want me to take over these makerspace shifts in the afternoon and she said yeah it would be great if you could do that but also i'm wanting to get more of the ELS staff involved in like running classes there and i was like i have an idea for a class you can laugh me out of the room if you like but i think it could be fun and every week from then, basically, I bit like I, I ran it for a little while and then had to stop because my hours changed, and yep. now we're back. Um, but yeah, I basically explained it to her and I said I want to run a class where I teach folks how to paint minis and talk shop about tabletop gaming, and then we're going to move on to first of all story stuff, uh, and then uh, in the next uh, two or three months we're going to be moving on to like like world building, like building maps. Okay. And then we're going to move on to doing like world tiles and like being able to build an entire diorama out of all the things that we've learned how to do together and then at the end of the year we're going to do a big showcase of like all the stuff we've learned how to do and put it in a big dungeon yes and then play D, &D with it that's very cool <laughs> i love that yeah um and but the, but the best part is like there's there's folks who are like adjacent to this group who don't necessarily come and see me every week but there's a couple of folks who play warhammer and they come in usually right after i'm um, finished tidying away my dungeoneers club stuff but they'll use the same sort of tools and resources yeah. and they usually sit and chat with me and uh get into that sort of stuff and i'm kind of slowly starting to fold the two groups in together to like extend the time out to two hours so we can both come together and just sort of like do yeah, that stuff do things and, um, and they'll have a yeah. lot of experience as well because there's a lot of yeah, miniature painting yeah. and stuff and yeah because like, yeah that, that's kind of what i wanted to extend it out to because it's not just D, &D mini painting because mm -hmm. quite often what we're doing like today for example when we when i ran the class is um, there are a couple of uh, folks who have just gotten into D and D, just gotten into tabletop gaming, and when I explained that you know I've been a dungeon master for a long time and a player for even longer, they were asking me questions and we were just talking shop about D and D and about what to do because one of them is she's just started an ice, Icewind Dale. Yes. Uh, uh, is it Rhyme of the Frost module? Maiden? Yeah. Yeah, so it's Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Yeah. But she's a brand new dungeon master and had never played Dungeons and Dragons before being yep. a dungeon master. So she was very kind of like, I'm scared, I don't know what to do. And I'm just like, okay, first of all, 
don't be afraid to change the rules. <laughs> if it doesn't look like it's working, change the rules. Yes, yes, that's um, you know, that's like, great advice for for any new beginner DMs out there. Is especially if you're running a campaign from a book, one of these pre-written adventure modules. Like it requires you to have knowledge about uh, maybe something in um, from page ten and then something from page two hundred and fifty-six. Mm -hmm. You're never going to be able to remember all that, and you don't want to sit there flipping through pages to try and find the information that you need. You got to have the confidence sometime to just make it up on the spot. And if it doesn't agree with what's written on that page, doesn't matter. It's your okay. adventure. Yeah, it's your adventure, Sven. Would you laugh at me if I told you I've never run a module ever in my life? Um, I I might laugh at you, but it wouldn't be in public. It'll be it'll be later tonight um, in private. Okay. I might have a chuckle to myself. Yeah, I might write it down yeah. in my diary. Uh, or something. Yeah. So I've, I've I've never never ever run uh, a built module ever. No, all that, of the games that I have run have been entirely homebrew. That doesn't surprise me one little bit i know there's a okay, lot of good. people out there who, who just they they look at those adventure books and they 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 think to themselves like i can't i can never remember all of this information yeah, so see, the thing is the thing is for me it's not like that it's more just like i start off with all the intentions yes to run a module yes and then things go horribly awry and i'm like well i guess we're just improvising it now yeah, it, it doesn't take <laughs> it doesn't take long no, for something no. to, they, because you, you can never you can never anticipate how people are going to engage with the story. You just you, you can't. No. You have to be ready. That's the beauty of it to to make it up on the spot. And you know what? If you're lucky, yeah. it'll it'll come back on the rails somewhere further down the line. Um, mm -hmm. But if it doesn't, then hey, guess what? Uh, you know. That's totally fine um, because that's what D and D is. It's it's, mm -hmm. it's it's collaborative storytelling. If you mm -hmm. pick up one of these adventure books, I've got a couple lying over here. Start off with an adventure, and if it's not what the players want to engage with, just yeah. let them do their thing. Yeah, because I've got a question for you. So, like, when you run games as a as a dungeon master, do you normally run to modules, or do you do a little bit of a combination, or do you do homebrew? Um, I started off running uh, ad, uh, adventure, like pre-written adventures. I've run <laughs> uh, Dragons of Ice by Peak. Um, I've run part of Dragons of Storm Rack Isle. I've run part of uh, Descent to Avernus, and I've run part of Out of the Abyss. Now, Out of the Abyss okay. is probably the best example. Descent to Avernus, um, sort of, um, it's the same thing, um, scheduling conflicts and all that kind of stuff. It was the beginning of my streaming experience when I was still streaming on um, Ando's channel, uh, Othic Gaming. Um, mm -hmm. Then I started running Out of the Abyss. Um, but I found a, a very similar thing that, that you know that we just sort of touched on uh, just a moment ago. I started off the adventure um, running it as per the book, um, but as the story progressed, I found that the story as it was written and the characters that they had created didn't match up. Now, yeah, the adventure out of the abyss. It's a great adventure. It's fun. But it just did not match the players. It did not match the characters. These characters needed space to shine, and it was very limited in Out of the Abyss. It's a lot of narrow corridors, bleak, mm -hmm. you know, towns and all that kind of stuff. Dark but a lot stuff, of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, a lot of lot of dark stuff, and and not really. There were no taverns or anything like that for them to engage no with. No beach episodes. No beach episodes. Um, plenty of mushrooms, though, which um, I don't know if oh, anyone... I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a whole story to tell you about mushrooms in the Feywild world, but we'll save that for later. I don't know why, but it seems to be a common thread with almost every D&D &D adventure out there. Mushrooms <laughs> mushrooms seem to factor into it one way or another, but uh, that's a that's a story for another time. You know, it just it wasn't fitting the characters. They, had, they made such yeah. amazing characters, and they were so stifled by this setting that i was like you know what i'm gonna completely change this up in the, bin. In, the in bin. the bin in the bin in the bin ended up being yeah. a homebrew spell jammer campaign um which you can check out some of those uh, episodes um on youtube uh it's called far beyond the void and it couldn't be any more different than what uh out of the abyss was 
Um, and you could just immediately tell the difference um, in the way that the characters were able to sort of flourish. And we told so much more of a compelling story when we were able to come up with it ourselves and there were no limitations as to what we did mm -hmm. now the way that i ran that is i took some information from the um from the spelljammer source book i took some locations and stuff like that but then i built upon that so i had something to fall back yeah. on if i needed it but i wasn't yeah. beholden to any piece of law i could just make mm -hmm. it up as i as i went along which i think mm -hmm. is probably the best way to run something don't say, I want to run out of the abyss. Say you want to run a campaign in the Underdark, make up the story yourself, and pick and choose the bits and pieces that you like out of that adventure. Yeah. And saying that, though, like that does require quite a... I'm speaking from my own personal experience, like running Avalon, which is the campaign that I homebrewed, it relies on this vast aquifer of storytelling and knowledge that I already owned. And had read through and passed and just sort of like amalgamated into this into this uh, behemoth that is the Avalon campaign now. I'm writing a book about the Avalon campaign, uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, but for new players and for new DMs, starting off with a module isn't necessarily a bad thing, um, despite what, what we've both just said, it's just these things don't necessarily fit our gameplay styles or our dungeon yes. mastering styles. But if you're new and you're just getting into it and you don't quite feel uh i don't want to say brave enough because that's not the right word if you don't if you don't quite feel prepared enough to branch out into into like completely homebrew made up storytelling modules are such a valuable tool to play through anyway like even if you feel that things are getting out of control you are the dungeon master you get to make the rules operate exactly how you want them to like you can always bend the rules of 5e <laughs> that's what makes it such a valuable platform to play from Yes. Um, but yeah, even though we're even though we're both talking mad smack about modules and how we can't play them, that is more of a re reflection on us than it is on anyone else who's trying to use them. Because I would love to one day run like a Curse of Strahd. Mm -hmm. Like I think that's the kind of one that I would want to do, or Vampires of the Masquerade, or like something like that. Something gothic. Something dark. Something real, something real dark. Something well dark. <laughs> something well dark. Um, yeah, because that that fits my playstyle. Because quite often I do like a whimsical horror. There's like, oh yeah, fun, whimsy, good stuff, and then just really dark shit. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> like real dark shit. Mm -hmm. But then whimsy and fun, and then, oh, oh, there's a seed of evil in here. Um, but again, that's just from my own experience of being in, uh, quite far read and having a huge aquifer of knowledge to draw from, an aquifer of like all sorts of different foods that I can pull together. But at the same time, I'm like 32 years old. I have had a very, very long time to build the pathways for making stories easy to tell if you're just getting into it or if you're just getting started do not for a second think that you're bad at it you just haven't had enough practice yes. keep playing keep thinking keep creating keep writing stories even if you think no one's going to hear them or no one's going to want to play them because i guarantee you if you upload a module that you've homebrewed yourself at least one party's going to play it at least one person's going to play it who will have probably no relation to you whatsoever but someone's going to play it Someone. And someone's going to get sunk in and someone's going to be like, this is fucking rad. I want to take this and run with it. And that's the beauty of tabletop gaming. It's you cannot put a price on imagination and a pencil or a, you know, like character sheet. You, you can't do it. Wizards of the Coast tried. <laughs> they certainly tried. <laughs> tried. Yes, in a very publicized uh, yeah, In a manner. very publicized and cringe and embarrassing way. Um but yeah just let, let the modules open the door for you a little bit i think yeah i think there's a, probably the best way to explain it right there like, is a little bit of a stigma <clears throat> around uh running adventures uh from modules you know a lot of uh big names and content creation around tabletop rpgs and dnds &D. so we'll talk a little bit of smack about running games out of adventure modules i am but do, do, do they not forget that like that's where everyone started that's or where that's where they first like got their teeth in, that's where it all right? begins like, i think it, I think it, it comes begins. down to a little bit like trying to come across as being like a figure of authority in certain things look mm. how good i am at making stories and all that mm. kind of stuff but some people don't have that time some people don't have that you know that 
improv like that enjoyment of improvising things on the spot some mm. people like to have a little bit more structure some people like to have a book and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that homebrew is not better than pre-written adventure modules it's just <laughs> not okay literally compare compare the word that we use for it's homebrew home versus corporate brew yes there's 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 like heineken and then there's the really intense pilsner that your uncle's best friend makes yes. two or three times a year they're both good but one is consistently good yes. one delivers the same product over and over again to the enjoyment of millions versus one that produces something really really good but only for a short time and only to a very select group of people who know the background context that's a, probably a good way of explaining it it's like there's one that appeals to a lot of folks yep and it's really accessible and is a really really valuable tool for getting folks into the tabletop rpg genre but then you can't like separate the two because if you do then you prevent people from moving across the boundaries as well yeah which is not what we want like you know the, the more creative people that we have in the tabletop space the better but you can only get those people in by not gatekeeping shit yes like just do whatever feels right do whatever you feel comfortable doing until you feel comfortable doing something else enough yeah. to do something else to do something else yeah Cause, exactly yeah because yeah like, i like that like, uh, I, yeah analogy of uh, of like homebrew beer like one is it's yeah it's like a it's like a corona you can rely on it it's going to be there it's mm -hmm. going to be in your store it's you can have it every, every single time. week it's going to be the same every single time and the other one might literally kill you but hey sometimes uh it's worth it's taking adventure. a risk it's a it's an adventure and it's uh it's you know it's worth taking a risk but so, yeah. sometimes that's when the like the most amazing things um sort of uh bloom from and that is and that ladies and gentlemen and gentle dames is where we get craft beer from yeah you have, you have homebrew, homebrew you have craft beer and then you have standardized beer exactly and the funniest part is this is coming from someone called liquor witch and i'm just explaining it in terms that makes sense, <laughs> terms to that makes like, sense to you know like you've got you've got the beer that appeals to the masses you've got a beer that appeals to the food but it's still mass produced and then you have the beer that appeals to the very few who know about the context of it and for some very insular homebrew campaigns that works and that's totally fine and you know like like for me that's what avalon is avalon is something that i cooked up for a very particular audience and a very particular uh group of folks who play with me every week um but the story is bigger than me and i am going to write it into something else because i feel like it's 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 there's too much in me to not let it out yes whether or not anyone reads it i don't really care i still have to make it anyway because otherwise it will burn me from the inside but then you compare it to stuff that you'd be able to buy at your local like liquor store where it's like craft beer it's it's catered to a certain taste like lots of hops higher or lower alcohol really big flavors like you know craft beer etc etc and then you, which are the really sort of more in-depth modules that will allow you to be a little bit more creative and bend the rules a little bit like curse of Strahd is an excellent example of that um some of the stuff that our critical role is doing with the candle wick chronicles i think is what it's called mm, yeah and stuff like that. and stuff and stuff like call of cthulhu and some of those other things fit into that craft beer category and then you've got the vast aquifer of modules that have come out for 5e which are perfectly Perfectly adequate fine. yeah perfectly fine and you know, you know yeah yeah so if that's the way you enjoy playing it just just play it that way don't worry about it when mm -hmm. any, anyone else says because you know yeah it's, fuck em. it's all a personal fuck it's all it's a your personal game. experience yeah exactly it's your game fuck them okay. fuck them fuck 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 uh and on and that also, note if yeah fuck them <laughs> <laughs> fuck i think that's where we uh we're gonna bring um the first half of this episode to a close so if you're watching this on youtube or listening back uh on spotify or whatever this will be the end of episode seven uh but stick with us because we're going to be right back uh with the uh with the next episode episode eight um uh so if you want more uh of this infinite wisdom uh that you've been provided with wisdom we still. Oh uh, well, you know, let's let the people at home decide whether or not uh, whether or not it's wise. Um, everybody, everybody, make an insight check. Make an DC's insight 18. check. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, stick with us because we'll be right back with episode eight with more infinite wisdom from the a very talented with which. It's true. Don't look at me like that. It's true. You know it. <laughs> <laughs>